I think that aliens in outer space don't use rocket ships. They don't use that rocket ships because they crash, they have problems with gamma rays, radiation, food, whatever. They've digitized themselves, placed their consciousness on a laser beam, and there's a laser highway. A laser highway that could be right next to the Earth, for all we know, carrying the digitized souls of civilizations, and we're totally clueless. We're so stupid, we don't even know that that's how the aliens move from place to place. You can break the light barrier consistent with Einstein's theory of general relativity. The first was actually proposed by Einstein himself in 1935. In 1935, he looked at a black hole, which looks like a funnel. Things fall into the black hole, and then you put two of them back to back, so that if you fell into this funnel, you would come out the other end. That's called a wormhole, which Einstein worked out with his student, Nathan Rosen, back in 1935. 35. And you can actually go faster than the speed of light by going through the wormhole. The aliens are not there. The aliens are here. They visited us. And I say, what proof do you have that the aliens are here? And they tell me that they've been abducted. They've been kidnapped by aliens in outer space. Well, I have a word of advice. If you have ever been kidnapped by an alien from outer space, for God's sake, steal something. I don't care whether it's a paperclip, an alien pen, an alien calculator. Steal something. Because afterwards you can say, aha, look, look. Look, look, proof, proof. I'm a physicist. We live and die by the evidence. If Elon Musk wants to put a million settlers on Mars, you have to have fleets of workers to begin the process of building things unless you create the first self-replicating robot. With one self-replicating robot, you get two, then four, then eight, 16, 32, 64, until you have an army of these robots that can build cities on Mars. And so that's the weak link. Everyone dreams of having these gigantic domed cities on Mars as part of our science fiction heritage. But who Who's going to build these dome cities? Einstein believed in two types of God. One was the God of the Bible, the personal God, the God that answers prayers, walks on water, performs miracles. That's the personal God that he didn't believe in. He believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of order, harmony, beauty. The universe could have been messy, random, but it's gorgeous. You realize that on a single sheet of paper, we can write down all the known laws of the universe. Einstein's equation is one inch long. String theory is a lot longer. But you could put all these equations on one sheet of paper. If you can raise the temperature of Mars by six degrees, that's right, just six degrees, you can create a runaway greenhouse effect. The polar ice caps will melt and it'll be possible to have agriculture and will terraform Mars. Now, some people think that terraforming is too difficult. Well, realize that we are terraforming the Earth right now for worse, not for better. We are we're now terraforming the Earth. We're changing the atmosphere of the Earth. And we could also do that to Mars. What is dark matter? Can it be touched? Is it dangerous? Most of the universe is made out of dark matter. Dark matter surrounds the Milky Way galaxy. If it wasn't for dark matter, the Milky Way galaxy would have spun out of control and the Earth would be flung into outer space. Can it be touched? Well, no, because it would filter right through your fingertips, right through the atoms of your body. Is it dangerous? No, because it doesn't interact with us. And then here's the big question. What is it? There's a Nobel Prize out there waiting for that person who could figure out what dark matter is. When you look at pictures from the Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope, realize that many of these pictures are just one little pinpoint, one little pinpoint in the night sky magnified to give you these gorgeous pictures pictures you see on the TV, right? That little dot, that pinpoint of light, contains trillions of stars. Each dot in that photograph that you see on national television is a galaxy. That's a hundred billion stars in each dot. And how many dots are there in that pinpoint? Billions. What we're talking about is a photograph, trillions of stars. Think about that for a moment. We're headed toward creating machines that are smarter and smarter, and eventually they'll realize self-awareness. Now, robots do not know they're a robot. Robots have no self-awareness. However, by the time they're as smart as a monkey, I think they will start to have self-awareness. At that point, I think they're potentially dangerous because they realize that we are not part of the self. We're not part of the tribe. And why should they take orders from us when they're not part of the tribe? So I think as a interim measure, we should put a chip in their brain that simply shuts them off once they start to question who they are with respect to humanity. One of the fundamental paradoxes of the universe is 
is the universe is based on a simple number of constants, like the speed of light, the mass of a proton. But where do these numbers come from? These numbers are tuned, tuned like a radio, to be exactly those frequencies and energies which make life possible. If the nuclear force were a little bit stronger, the sun would have burnt out billions of years ago, and we wouldn't be here talking about this. If the nuclear force were a little bit weaker, the sun would never ignite it at all, and we still wouldn't be here. Right. Everything is just right to be tuned to allow for life. If you were to fall into a black hole, from your point of view, it would take perhaps a few minutes, let's say, to fall through a black hole, depending upon where you started from. Your watch says that you went right through to the center of the black hole. But from outside, somebody with a telescope looking at you from outer space would see you frozen in time, slowly going into the black hole. Because time beats at a different rate from the outside and the inside. Get your head around this. Time can be at different rates at different points in the universe. If the moon goes around the earth, the earth goes around the sun, then what does the sun go around? Well, we know the answer to that. The sun goes around a black hole in the constellation Sagittarius at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, if you look at that black hole, it's rather disappointing. Dust clouds obscure the galactic nuclei. If you could somehow remove the dust clouds, then you would see a fireball. Fireball rise every night, perhaps rivaling the moon in brightness with a raging black hole at the center. Unfortunately, dust clouds prevent us from seeing this huge fireball that by rights should be illuminating the night sky. Why do we die? We die because of errors. Errors build up in our cells, in our genes, in our hormones. These air buildup is why we die. But now with genetic engineering, we can dream of the possibility of correcting these mistakes, correcting the errors that develop in our genome. And that means perhaps extending the human lifespan. So for the first time in history, we can now think about living forever and not be locked up in a lunatic farm. We're talking about immortality as being part of our medical agenda. We cannot find any law of physics preventing you from going backwards in time. It seems to be consistent with the known laws of physics. The trick is you have to have this energy on the scale of a star. You'd have to be a very advanced civilization. So these tourists from the future are just not a hundred years into the future. These tourists from the future would be perhaps millions of years in the future, the ability to control the output of a star. We physicists are hot rodders of physics. We push the equations until they break down. So Stephen Hawking assumed that they would break down. Well, we were shocked. They didn't break down. The laws of physics seem to be compatible with time machines. This is very unsettling because it means that perhaps, just perhaps, time travel is possible for advanced civilization. How will the universe end? We have several possibilities. One possibility is a big crunch when the universe squashes together in a gigantic ball of flame and maybe bangs once again. Another possibility is the big freeze, that the universe expands and just keeps on going and we're all going to freeze to death and we're all going to die when the universe reaches near absolute zero. Then there's something called the big rip, where the universe goes into an exponential expansion and expands so rapidly that the distant galaxies can no longer be seen because they travel faster than the speed of light. That even the distant galaxies break Break the light barrier, and that's called the Big Rip, meaning that the night sky will be totally black, except for some of the nearby stars. Three things made us intelligent. One is our eyesight. We have the eyes of a hunter, stereo vision so we lock in on targets. Who is smarter, predator or prey? Predators are smarter than prey. They have their eyes at the front of their face, like lions, tigers. Hunters have to zero in on the target. They have to know how to ambush. They have to know how to hide. Second is the thumb. The opposable thumb of some sort, could be a claw or a tentacle. So hand-eye coordination. Hand-eye coordination is the way we manipulate the environment. And then three, language. Mama bear never tells baby bear to avoid the human hunter. Bears just learn by themselves. They never hand out information from one generation to the next. So these are the three basic ingredients of intelligence. How many animals have all three? We actually found evidence of something that may look like a type 2 civilization, though that's very, very speculative. There's something called tabby's 
star that decreases in intensity by 20% periodically. Now, that's incredible. Stars don't simply diminish by 20% in intensity after a few years. So the theory is that maybe there's a Dyson sphere. A type 2 civilization creates a sphere around the mother star to absorb all the energy from the mother star. That's called a Dyson sphere. And so the thinking was that maybe a Dyson sphere is orbiting around Tabby's star, diminishing sunlight by 20%. Well, that's a theory. Some people think it's comet dust or a smudge on a telescope, but there it is. 20% reduction in starlight in a star, that which is unheard of. We could be special to the Earth, but in outer space, there could be other different kinds of life forms dependent upon different factors, like yeah. the octopus, the porpoise, spiders. Right. It's possible to imagine other life forms that could also be intelligent if there's an evolutionary pressure on them. But dinosaurs were around for 200 million years, and to the best of our knowledge, not a single one became intelligent. We <laughs> humans, we've been around for 200,000 years. That's nothing, nothing 200,000 years, and we became intelligent. The dinosaurs had 200 million years to become intelligent. None of them made it. Just remember, the dinosaurs did not have a space program, and that's why they're not here today. So to have a space program could be an evolutionary bottleneck. If your species does not develop a space program, sooner or later, you're going to get wiped out. We've already identified 4,000 exoplanets orbiting other stars. Every single star, on average, has a planet going around it, and about one-fifth or so of them have Earth-sized planets going around them. We're talking about out of 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, we're talking about billions of potential Earth-sized planets. And to believe that we're the only one, and how many galaxies are there? Within sight of the Hubble Space Telescope, there are about 100 billion billion galaxies. How many stars are there in the visible universe? A hundred billion galaxies times a hundred billion stars per galaxy. We're talking about a number beyond human imagination. And to believe that we're the only ones, I think, is, is rather ridiculous. Why is fusion so difficult to put on the Earth? Because in outer space, stars are monopoles. They are poles, single poles that are spherically symmetric. And it's very easy to get spherically symmetric configurations of gas to compress into a star. It just happens naturally all by itself. The problem is magnetism is bipolar. You have a North Pole and a South Pole. And it's like trying to squeeze a long balloon. Take a long balloon and try to squeeze it. You squeeze one side, it bulges out the other side. Well, that's the problem with fusion machines. We use magnetism with a North Pole and a South Pole to squeeze gas and all sorts of anomalies and horrible configurations can take place because we're not squeezing something uniformly like in a star. Star Stars, in some sense, are for free. Fusion on the Earth is very difficult. You simply jack in a program into our brain and bingo, we are karate masters. Bingo, we know how to drive a helicopter. Can we do that? And the answer is probably not because the brain is not really a computer. It doesn't process digital information. Our brain is a learning machine. It learns by itself to correct its previous mistakes. While well, your laptop today is just as stupid today as it was yesterday. Our brain has no windows. It has no software. It has no programming, but it simply learns tasks as it goes along. Therefore, the interface between digital information and memory is quite complicated. These are in some sense to operating systems. So eventually we may master that ability, but we have to reverse engineer the brain. So don't expect to become a karate master anytime soon by simply pushing a button. There could be type one, type two, or type three civilizations. A type one civilization is maybe a hundred years more advanced than us to maybe a thousand years, sort of like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. They control the weather, volcanoes, earthquakes, anything planetary they control. That's type Type one. Then there's type two. They harness the power of an entire star, like Star Trek. Star Trek would be a typical type two civilization where they manipulate entire stars. Then there's type three. Type three is galactic. They roam the galactic space lanes. They play with black holes, like, like the Empire of uh, the Star Wars series would be a typical type three civilization. Well, we are maybe a hundred years away from being type one. We're maybe a few thousand years from being from type two, and we're maybe a hundred 
100,000 years from being type 3. The two greatest mysteries in all of science. One, what happened before creation? Why did we have a Big Bang? What banged? Are there other universes, a multiverse, mm. before the Big Bang? That's outer space. Then the second mystery is inner space. What goes on behind your eyeballs? We have 100 billion neurons in your brain, as many as stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Each neuron is connected to 10,000 other neurons. And so what is the brain? 50 years ago, we made a huge mistake. We thought the brain was a computer. The brain doesn't have anything resembling the brain except neural activity. We now understand that the brain is a pattern-seeking neural network, a learning machine, and it learns and rewires every time it learns something new. It will take centuries to terraform Mars. The key is not to bring pumps to the planet Mars because it costs too much money. The way to do it is to take advantage of Mars' own topology, geography, and nature. Beneath the surface of Mars, there's lots of carbon dioxide. If you could heat up the planet a little bit, that'll release carbon dioxide and initiate a greenhouse effect, which will then melt more ice and let more carbon dioxide come up. So in other words, you have an autocatalytic effect. You just have to jumpstart it. Once you jumpstart it, more carbon dioxide creates more temperature, heats up the planet, which releases more carbon dioxide. So then the question is, how do you jumpstart it? A number of mechanisms have been proposed. Greenhouse effects, hydrogen bombs, nuclear power plants to raise the temperature of Mars a little bit, and that will then set off a chain reaction, releasing even more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That's the cheapest way to take advantage of the carbon dioxide that already exists rather than hauling pumps and generators from the Earth